Good morning uh, and welcome to uh, our live webinar on business tax, a refresher and planning, uh, part two. Please don't worry if you missed part one. Um, part two is a standalone, uh, standalone webinar and I'm sure you'll get a lot from it. Uh, there's certainly a lot of content to go through. Uh, my name is Tom Adcock, not Jalen um, Sonat. Uh, unfortunately, my, my laptop has given up the ghost this morning, uh, and so I'm now impersonating someone else. I'm one of the tax partners here at Gravita, uh, uh, and as all of you, I'm sure, know by now, uh, Gravita is a consolidator that brought together my firm, uh, which was CBW, along with a few others, APG and JH, to name a couple, uh, to create what is now uh, Gravita, uh, a single office firm in central London, or at least will be very, very soon when we move into our new home uh, in the middle of March. So uh, so without further ado, oh, and one thing, uh, Tim has got a lot of content in this. And um, I think what's best is that if you've got any questions, and I'm sure you will have, uh, either to email them to Tim uh, after the, after the, uh, uh, the webinar or just email uh, whoever you might know at Gravita uh, uh, to ask those questions. I'm sure either Tim or, or myself or anyone else within the tax team will be able to help. Anyway, um, Thank you so much for, for coming along. I hope you'll enjoy. I hope you enjoy the show and uh, look forward to, to speaking to you again soon. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Tom. Have a safe flight. I know you're flying right. to them now. Safe flight to you. Thank you very much. Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this business tax refresher and planning part two webinar. Um, don't, as Tom said, don't worry if you missed part one because this is a standalone webinar. I'm Tim Palmer. Uh, I lecture all around the UK. As well as that, I'm very pleased and proud to be a tax consultant with Gravita. Um, this is going to be a very practical session. We're going to run it for one hour. We're going to finish at 10 o'clock. Um, I trust you've all got a set of notes. I'm sure you have because Hillary and her team are excellent and they would have emailed you those notes um, yesterday. Um, as Tom said, I'm going to answer questions today by email. So if you want to email me, um, you know, there's hundreds watching today, so please don't email me too many. But um, if you've got some, a question, one question perhaps, email me and I'll attempt to answer it uh, sometime today. Uh, my email address is on the screen now. You might want to make a note of that, tim.palmer at gravita.com. There is a lot to cover now, okay? So if you can turn to the notes, go to page two, We've got seven or eight chapters this morning, parts, and I-35 is probably the biggest, the most important, and part one. So if you go to page two, um, I like to think that I'm an expert in I-35. Um, I know that sounds big-headed, but I like to think I am because I've followed it ever since it came in. And people do say to me, how did I, the term I-35 originate? Well, I don't, I'm sure a lot of you know, but if you go to the top of page two, can I just tell you, um, in 1999, March 1999, there was a budget and it was a huge budget and they had a press release, press release 35 in the March 1999 budget. And in the top corner, it was press release IR35, and it was all about HMRC attacking one-man bank companies, personal service companies, who, which people in 1999 and previous prior to that were using to avoid employment. And there was going to be attack, and if you were caught to this new anti-avoidance legislation, um, you would have to account for pairs you earn and national insurance on your fees in very general terms. And... This is going to sound really big headed, but I think I would, me, Tim Palmer, I think I was responsible for the term I-35. Shall I tell you why? Very, very quickly. I know we've got a million things to get through, but um, past training, as they were then, booked me to do a lecture live on the budget in their theatre. And they had a TV, huge TV in the theatre, and it was divided into four and it showed Manchester, Birmingham, various other places where they booked up and had theatres, and it, my lecture was being broadcast live all over the country. And I actually termed this I-35, and it, um, you know, to hundreds of people in each theatre, and the word passed like wildfire, and everybody start, started calling it I-35 following my live lecture. So I think that 
I'm going to take responsibility for that. I was responsible for um, the term R35. Um, the press release, if I look up now, I'm in my office, in my studio, and on the wall, I have a signed, just going to take my glasses off looking at it, I have a signed um, photo of me and Harry Kane, and next to it is, a, is the original framed R35 press release. That is very sad, I know, but um, it's, it's on my office wall and it's part of my life and has been for the last um, 26 years. Now, R35, when they brought in the legislation on the 6th of April 2000, uh, sorry, uh, yes, yeah, 6th of April 2000, it, it, nothing happened really. And uh, it was down to the one man bank companies to self assess and confess that uh, they were caught to R35. And surprisingly, not many companies seem to confess. So for the first 15 years, there was very little um, in terms of tax yield and tax take for the government. And they'd had enough of it, so they decided to make some changes. And the first change came in in 2017. Follow the notes closely this morning because everything I'm saying is in the notes. Um, and they made the public sector's bodies responsible, um, the NHS, London Transport, people like that, all responsible for if they were engaging a one-man bank company were they caught to r35 would the company be a deemed employee if the individual didn't have his company i'll come to the tests on r35 what is r35 in a moment so they made public sector bodies responsible in 2017 and that was quite a big shock and when i was doing my lectures loads of people used to come around to me and saying that the water companies, the, um, you know, all the public sector bodies um, had started to deduct pay as you earn from the companies that were working for them and national insurance. So that was a big change. And yet the biggest was on the 6th of April 2021, where the government said, right, OK, we're going to bring in large and medium sized engagers in the private sector and they're going to have to be responsible for R35 and they're going to have to make the decision is this contract engagement court to R35? Um, very briefly, what is a medium or large size engager in very general terms? They have to meet two out of these three tests. Is their turnover greater than 10.2 million? Have they got more than 5.1 million um, in the balance sheet? And do they employ more than 50 employees, including part-time employees? So medium and large size, size engagers are responsible for R35. Now, the tests for R35, if you've got a pen there, you'll need to mark up the notes this morning with my extra comments. And a few years ago, I was in a meeting with HMRC on R35, right? And this HMRC officer, he said to me quite openly, he said, we are trained. And he said, there are two tests to determine if Bob Limited, a one-man bank company, is caught to R35. And I said to the inspector in the meeting, tell me the tests. And he said, um, the two steps. And he said, we have to find, first of all, an individual Bob. Any names I'm using this morning are purely hypothetical to ease my lecture. And he's working through his personal service company, Bob Limited. <coughs> Excuse me. And he has a client, a big regular client that he regularly does work for. And HMRC said, that is step one. And they said, do you agree? They said that to me. Do you agree that we've met step one in the particular engagement that I was there to defend in the meeting? I said, yes, you have. And they seemed very pleased about that. And then the inspector said, right, we're going to step two. Let's imagine hypothetically, which the legislation gives the revenue the power to do. There's no doubt about that. Let's imagine that Bob has not got a company, has not got the protection of a company, and he's working directly as an individual for the client. We HMRC have to prove that he would be an employee of that client if he didn't have the protection of his company. So step two is to disregard Bob Limited to take it away and to pretend that Bob is working directly for the client 
And would Bob, in those circumstances, be an employee on the payroll of the client? HMRC had to prove that. And the inspector then said to me in the meeting, he said, do you agree that we prove that step two in this case? And I said, no, most certainly I do not. And there was a note taker in the meeting and the inspector said, why do you think we haven't proved it? Because I said, if my client didn't have his company, if he worked directly, Bob, if he worked directly for the big engager, he would be self-employed. And HMRC said to me, prove it. I said, I can prove it. I've got a contract. And if you look at the contract, it says everything that I'm going to say to you, that the contract between uh, Bob Limited and the client, there's no control over Bob. He's a very experienced guy. They give him the work. They leave him to do it. There's no control over him. There's an agreement that if he's really busy, he can turn the work down. There's no mutuality of obligations. They've accepted that Bob is in demand and sometimes he can't do the work. So he will provide a substitute at the same technical level as him. I also said that in the contract, there's an agreement that Bob Limited will pay their own relevant insurance. And I went on and I said, you prove step one but you haven't proved step two. And at the end of that meeting, HMRC, the inspector, agreed. And he said, you've given me further information. I hadn't. I put it all in the correspondence previously, but that's beside the point. And he actually ended the meeting by saying, we accept that this particular engagement is outside the scope of R35. So you do have to fight your battles. You really do. Um, and I think... I'm going to be honest with you, it's important to refer to case law where you can. And this morning, you know, I'm very limited for time. Uh, I've got to cover lots of other subjects as well as R35. But can I just say one thing? I think, and this is very much my area, I think there's been two big cases on R35 um, in recent years, and they're so extreme. The first one, Dave Clark. Now, if you say Dave Clark to people of my era, we always think of Dave Clark, the drummer, bits and pieces and glad all over and things like that. But that wasn't this Dave Clark. This was Dave Clark who presented the darts for Sky Sports. And he did that through his company, Little Piece of Paradise Limited. Um, and that's step one. And HMRC said, we think that Dave Clark, if he didn't have his company, if he worked directly for um, uh, Sky as an individual, he would be self-employed. And I agree 100%. In this case, the revenue were correct. Um, I'm going to have to leave you to read the notes in certain areas. But very briefly, Little Piece of Paradise, Dave Clark's company, really, the Sky contract was the only contract that they had, only client, really, that they had. And also, they were, uh, Dave Clark was on a set fee. Um, and it worked out to 12500 turnover to page three a month. Um, and his company got the fee, whether they did any uh, broadcasting or not. Um, I think Dave Clark was under the control of Sky. I think there was mutuality of obligations. To me, I hate to say it, but this is the classic case that is R35 that is caught. He never appealed. And I think there must have been a question mark. Should he have ever gone to the tribunal in the first place? So that's my extreme case where I think really, yep, caught to R35. I'm going to be really frank and honest with you the whole way through this webinar uh, this morning. There's been another recent case, Phil Thompson, you know, the ex-Liverpool um, defender, an England uh, uh, defender who was a pundit on Sky Sports. And I think similar circumstances to Dave Clark and Phil Thompson's just lost his case, literally, uh, you know, I'm including very recent things this morning. So the Dave Clark case is a case that I think uh, symbolizes where R35 really does apply. The other case on the opposite side of the spectrum is Adrian Charles's case, Basic Broadcasting Limited, where I read that case for half an hour and I thought that is not called to R35. Normally it takes me in a meeting with clients, reading it, within half an hour I honestly feel I can say, yeah, call or outside the scope of R35. And I always felt that this case was not R35. Why? Well, again, because we're pushed for time. But let me off the top of my head tell you, 
Adrian Charles billed his services to ITV and BBC over various years through his company, Basic Broadcasting Limited. And that company had lots of clients, a huge amount of clients. And it did so many different things via Adrian Charles, after dinner speaking, radio shows, other TV shows. There was an element of risk. Um, Adrian Charles had um, a, um, an agent and the agent took quite a, a large chunk of the fees. Adrian Charles ran a business, he wrote books, he wrote, he did magazine articles. And I think ITV was hiring a brand name. And the judge agreed with everything that I thought. And the judge said Adrian Charles was in business on his own account. And I thought, yeah, not Cork to I-35, correct decision. Therefore, I'm absolutely staggered, if you look on the bottom of um, page three, the HMRC have announced that they're appealing the decision, which is very, very surprising. And very shortly, it goes to the upper tier tribunal. I only hope for the sake of Adrian Charles that this doesn't turn into another Kay Adams case where it goes on for 10 years, where Kay Adams was not caught to R35 all along. Right, okay, so this is quite a tough area. And um, my involvement is quite heavy in R35 and people contact me and have done ever since they changed the rules in 2021 really and the large engagers are now responsible. And quite often an accountant will contact me and say, we've got a case here where the large engager has notified us that they think R35 applies and they're going to deduct pay as you earn in class one. What do you think? So people hire me to review the case and to have a look at it and to give them my opinion. And a little while ago, this happened. And this lady, I've changed her name, Lucy. She had a personal service company, Lucy Limited. She was brilliant. And she did the TV adverts for one particular large retail outlet. Um, but she did other TV adverts for other things. She wrote articles, newspaper columns, everything. And I got a call from her accountant to say that the large retail company had sent her a status determination saying that um, the, the engagement was caught to R35. And they said, would you have a look at it? So I had a look at it. And again, half an hour, I actually had a meeting with Lucy, asked her lots of questions. And I came away very strongly thinking that this contract was not caught to R35, even though the huge retail outlet with a very big national firm of accountants had said it was. And um, so what we did, we appealed and we asked for a meeting with the um, retail outlet who seemed very reluctant to give us the meeting and their accountant, but eventually they agreed. And I gave a list of 10 things which are in your notes on page four. And I said, because of these 10 things, and I'm going to leave you to go down them. If Lucy was engaged by R, she would be self-employed and R35 wouldn't apply. And the accountants of R went through it with a tooth comb. And in the meeting, they didn't make agreement. It, it, it took another few weeks, but eventually, they backed down, they accepted she would be self-employed, they accepted I was correct, and this is a huge firm and a very big retail um, company. And we were lucky that we got in in time and no actual pay as you earn and national insurance was deducted. You have to move fast in these circumstances. Um, so, you know, this is a struggle, this is not easy. And I honestly think, I'm, I'm being really truthful from my webinar, this is today's from the the ground floor, really, my experiences. I think large companies at the moment are too trigger happy and they seem to be adopting a policy, if in doubt, apply R35, which is wrong. You can't do that, but they do. So, um, you know, we at Gravita could help you in this area. Um, you know, in life, I think it's very good to have contacts where you can think, yeah, this person 
our contact really specializes in I-35, they can help us. And we could do that for you because I'm really loathe to see people suffer pay as you earn a national insurance when they shouldn't do. Right, now, if we can move on very quickly because there are other areas to get through as well. Um, if somebody genuinely, like Dave Clark, for example, those types of situations is called to I-35, what happens? Well, if you go to page five, what will happen will be that the large engager will deduct pay as you earn a Nash insurance from the fees of Fred Limited, top of page five. Let's imagine that Fred Limited renders a fee of £100,000 and... Um, Bovit, any names that I'm mentioning are purely hypothetical just to ease my lecture. Bovit, a deducts pay as you earn a national insurance, say of 40. So Fred renders a fee of 100,000 to Bovit. Bovit says it's caught to R35. It is caught. And therefore, Bovit say deducts pay as you earn a national insurance, hypothetically, of 40,000. So, um, yeah, Fred would be a deemed employee in that situation, let's imagine. Right. So what happens? 100,000 fees are rendered. Bovit puts their fees through the payroll as if they were employing Fred and deducts pay as you earn in class one. If you've got a pen there, most of the cases that I've seen where the good, medium, large engagers, you know, apply R35 correctly, you might want to know they run two payrolls. They run a payroll for their staff and they run a separate payroll for those personal service companies court to R35. So it, in the cases I've seen, the large engagers who really know what they're doing, they run two payrolls, one for their employees and one for personal services companies court to R35. And they did up 40,000. Now the 60,000 is received by Fred Limited, but it's put through the payroll as if they were employing Fred, but they actually pay the net figure to Fred Limited. Yeah. And Fred Limited extracts it, Fred extracts it out of his company um, tax-free as tax-free salary or tax-free dividend. But the big thing that you want to note is even though the company rendered the fee, even though the company received it net, it's treated as employment income of Fred. So when the accountant is doing the tax return of Fred, it has to go on Fred's personal self-assessment income tax return as employment income of Fred. And Bovit will give a P60 to Fred at the end of the year. And Fred gives that to his accountant. And the accountant puts it on Fred's personal tax return with a credit for the pay as you earn. All of this is on page five and page six of your notes. We go to page six now. Um, so there's quite a lot to it. You have to sort the corporate tax out, but there won't be corporate tax on it because it's um, deemed employment income of Fred. And you get the P60 and you put the figures on Fred's personal tax return. Now, can I just say a couple more things before we leave I-35? This is going to cost the employer 13.8% employers NIC, the deemed employer. But they have to account for that. So it's going to cost them money and the time and effort to put it through their payroll. And remember that IR35 does apply to partnerships. Um, you could write, write by the side, Gary Lineker had a partnership and um, quite shortly at the upper tier tribunal, his case goes to IR35, um, a case on that very shortly. He won the first case, but uh, the big case really is at the upper tier tribunal. He formed a partnership with his ex-wife, Danielle, um, and the revenue are saying it's liable to I-35. It would be fascinating to see that, um, the outcome of that case. So the thing you've got to know is that I-35 does apply to personal service companies and partnerships. And the other thing to remember, right, this is something that so many people forget. If you've got a very big building contractor, huge contractor, and they regularly use Bob the Builder Limited. Yeah. Um, if the large contractor says, well, I think this is called to I-35, and I think Bob the Builder, Bob, if you didn't have your company, you'd be an employee of us. The large contractor's got to apply I-35, got to apply pay as you earn, doesn't apply SIS. 
you want to write in if there's ever a dispute between pay as you earn, I-35 and CIS. I-35 applies, pay as you earn applies, CIS doesn't. You can't have both. Pay as you earn overrides CIS. It's the same as if the individual was an employee of the big contractor. They did up pay as you earn. They put him on the payroll. CIS doesn't apply. You can't have both. We have seen some problems with that. And again, our team could help you in that area. Right. And finally, the last thing on R35 um, this morning. Finally, remember that if you go to the top of page seven, if you've got the situation where the engager is not a medium sized uh, engager or a large engager, it's a smaller engager, the smaller engager will not be responsible for R35. And then in those circumstances, the personal service company has to self-assess and um, declare everything to the revenue and account for the pairs you earn and national insurance themselves. We've explained all of that on the top of page seven. Right, so to conclude, there's a lot of different areas, a lot of different circumstances on R35. We could help you and we'd be delighted to help you because we want to see justice applied. Um, we could help you with your appeals, give verdicts on the situation. But can I just say one thing? There are extreme cases like the Dave Clark case where you're always going to be caught if you engage the individual in that manner. But if you do some planning and the personal service company agrees, I-35 quite legitimately can be avoided. You could structure the engagement in such a way that the individual would be self-employed if he didn't have his company. And we can provide advice on that as well. Right, okay, so that's I-35. Now, a lot to cover this morning. Can we go to page eight of your notes and the next area? Pay as you earn and Nash Insurance, which is very much in the news at the moment, isn't it? Nash Insurance, very much in the news. Right, can I cast your mind back to the autumn of last year, when we had our autumn statement and the chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, he turned around and said, right, OK, for employees, I'm going to reduce their national insurance by 2 percent. And we've seen the benefit of that or some employees have seen the benefit of that because that came in in January. So class one national insurance has been reduced quite a big reduction by 2 percent and it will benefit employees. And it's very strange that he actually did it way through the tax year but it's in now and employees pay less national insurance two percent less the surcharge still remains at two percent but it's the main rate of nic that's had the quite big reduction what about the self-employed people well self-employed people they've got to wait until 6 of april but their class four rate drops from nine to eight percent so um a drop for them as well which is pretty good news and they're scrapping class two. We wait details. There's no real details. I really hunt for these things. You know, I'm, I'm a scavenger. I really go through the internet all the time, every day. I'm so sad, but I must spend an hour each day uh, hunting the recent tax cases, any developments. Um, it's a bit like Tottenham, really. I'm, uh, before the um, transfer window closed, I was looking to see if we would get the boy from Chelsea. Um, and, you know, I'm fascinated by all the tax and national insurance changes. Um, so I'll wait to see the scrapping of class two. Um, that will be very interesting as well. But it was interesting. They never reduced employers NIC. So the poor old employer still pays 13.8%. Now, there is a footnote on page eight of your notes. And you can do some planning with national insurance. You really can. And if you've got a pen there, you might want to star this. Um, it's planning that we've done over the years for a long time now, and it's worked very well. I'm going to give you two bits of national insurance planning. If you've got an individual that owns his own, owns his company, and it's going through a tough time, as a lot of companies did following COVID, dreadful times, and he had to pump money into his company to keep it afloat. Hopefully now it's starting to get better. What we've done in those circumstances is to um, formalise a loan agreement between the individual and his company 
and then the company pays loan interest back to that individual. What's the advantages of doing that? Well, two main advantages, I hope you're noting all of this. The first advantage is there's no national insurance on loan interest, so it's a very good way of getting money out of the company. Secondly, the company, in practically all cases, will get a corporate tax deduction as well for that loan interest, and the corporate tax has gone up. Um, uh, the rate of corporate tax went up uh, fairly recently as well, so it's an attractive thing to do. The second thing, but again, you've got to make sure there's, there's knock-on effects with the second thing, I think, more in particular. If the individual owns the premises from which the company trades, but the individual owns, there's nothing to stop him charging rent to the company, and the company will get a, a deduction for the rent, tax deduction, and there's no national insurance on rent. But I'm going to have a caveat there. There may be other areas which don't make that attractive, but you've got to look at the whole position. So um, we could give you some further national insurance planning. Um, national insurance is expensive. I know it's been reduced recently, but it is expensive. And so anything you can do to mitigate or reduce it or remove it legally would be a sensible idea. Right, the next area, no more P11Ds. When I grew up in tax, one of the first things that I did was fill in P11Ds, piles of them. Um, I, was, I used to work, when I first joined the tax profession, I was um, 19, 19, 18, 19. And um, I joined a firm called Ball Baker Carnaby Deed in the 1970s, late 70s, um, in Southampton Row in Holborn. And I had a stack of P11Ds to do. Um, I think Paul Baker, from memory, were taken over by Hanukkah Foster. But um, I loved my time there. And it was strange recently, when I was doing a huge lecture, there was a guy in the audience, and I thought, I know you, I know you. And um, he worked with me at Paul Baker Carnaby Deed. So um, tax has got a, a lot of um, um, uh, nice things, really. But PLMDs are not nice things. But thankfully, they're being scrapped from 6 of April 2026. So you want to note that the government has just announced that PLMD forms are being scrapped from 2026. And from that date, every employer, well, we're waiting for the final legislation. But this is what I'm assuming from the very limited i really hate it when the revenue say something and then don't really give you the details behind what they're doing but they've said from 6 of april 2026 every employer in the uk will have to payroll their benefits in kind now payrolling of benefits in kind at the moment is voluntary but most of our clients do it because i think it's so satisfactory to do it um, we got used to it now. The software's got better. And if you payroll benefits, which I strongly recommend, you don't get loads of incorrect coding notices. You don't have to fill in P11D forms. And normally you haven't got an underpayment at the end of the year on your benefits because the tax has been deducted under pay as you earn on the benefits throughout the year. I'm a big fan. I wrote an article on payrolling of benefits um, uh, about 10 years ago now, practically. And um, it was a bestseller. And if you go to eBay, you can get signed copies of that article. Now I'm only joking. But um, yeah, so I've really followed this very, very closely. I await a lot more information. Now, the only thing that slightly concerns me is what's going to happen to Class 1A? Because you have to make that at the moment as a one-off and you still have to fill in this form P11DB, go to the bottom of page 8. Um, I think if they keep Class 1A, that they'll ask the employer to pay Class 1A monthly when they deduct the pay as you earn. But if you turn over the page to page 9, there are strong rumours at the moment, if you go over to page 9, um, that Class 1A by 6 of April 2026 will be scrapped. Okay, Um so hold on, yeah. So if you look at the notes, that fourth paragraph down on page nine, there are rumours 
that class 1a is going to be scrapped and the government will introduce class 1 on benefits in time from 6 of April 2026 and if they do that then employees and directors for the first time ever will pay their own personal national insurance on the benefits will that happen if i was a betting man i'm not a betting man i don't bet but if i was i would bet i think it will happen so it'll be very interesting we await with great interest the nitty gritty behind all of this and um one other thing that can i just say because i'm quite involved in PESU and audits class one and national insurance one of the big areas that causes a lot of problems for clients and accountants is company credit cards and why well because i think unfortunately um some directors do use a company credit card occasionally for private use do they reimburse it i'm not sure i doubt i don't know but there was a case on this this lecture is very up to date this morning there was a case on this um a few weeks ago uh, James Keeley and Premer versus HMRC um, at the start of this year. And this director had used the company credit card privately. He hadn't reimbursed the company. And there was obviously tax and national insurance problems. Can I leave you to read that case? You might want to star that case. But, you know, when our team go out and we help other accountants, we look at people's um, company credit cards, sometimes there is private use and the revenue will look at this they will ask for copies of the company credit card the director's credit card statements for the last 12 months and they will go through them with a tooth comb trying to identify private use and you have to be very very careful with that um you know that's leads to a pay you an investigation pay you an audit and you have to be incredibly careful in that area um lots of things we got our own pay as you and team and we could help you with that likewise with investigations um you may have watched uh the lecture that uh, dion and i did the webinar uh, very recently dion and i have actually got an article coming out next week in taxation magazine which um i strongly recommend that you have a look at or knock knock who's there about investigations that's coming out next week in taxation magazine so you might want to have a look at that and our investigations team can help you in any of these areas. Right, can we move on? Page 10, part three, cars and vans. Right, okay, um, cars. When I check computations for accountants, which I do, I do find sometimes that the accountant or their tax department claims the wrong cap allowances for cars. That table, I don't mind, you could photocopy it, that is a summary of the cap allowances available. Can I very quickly go through it with you? If a business buys a brand new electric car, fully electric, they get 100% cap allowances. If they buy a second-hand electric car, and can I say some of our clients are buying second-hand electric cars because they're so cheap, they depreciate so quickly. And when you buy a second-hand electric car, you can get a very reasonable cheap car but you only get 18% cap allowances on those. Turning to hybrids, if you've got a very low emission hybrids, which most are not, so you'll be lucky to get it, but if you've got a low emission hybrid, 50 grams or less, you get 18%. Um, if the emissions are more than 50, you only get six. In my experience, I think most hybrids only get 6% cap allowances, which isn't very much. You've got to be careful I would recommend that if you do company computations, in particular tax computations, you keep um, a look at that and make sure that when you're logging in and doing your um, uh, entries, that you really do put the expenditure in the right box for the right amount, the right percentage. Right, brief word on electric cars. Um, if a director or an employee has got an electric, fully electric company car, the tax is so cheap, it's just not believable. The benefit in kind, 2% of the list price. Mark Rubinson um, and myself, uh, we wrote an article um, on um, electric cars a few years ago now, and it was very well received. Um, and um, I've always followed electric cars um, fully, you know, really heavily. Uh, there was an article on electric cars yesterday saying there was problems with the chargers 
there are problems with them. And I still think that the infrastructure in London is not good enough. You know, I've got a friend and sometimes we go into London together in his electric car socially and there's problems. You know, a lot of the charging points seem to have been vandalised. There isn't enough of them. There's queues. I think there's still problems in this area with the infrastructure. But if you know what you're doing and you've got a lovely electric company car, you're only taxed on 2% of the list price. And that's going to be the same for next year as well. So it's really a very tax efficient benefit in kind. And remember that if you have got a fully electric company car, you can benefit from 10 things, really. Can I put them up on the screen? Um, you've got unlimited private use of the electric car. The employer will insure it for you. All of this is covered by the 2%, you know, negligible benefit. The employer can repair it, valet it weekly. The employer will have the financial outlay for the car, not you. All of this effectively is there within the notes on page 11, but I'm actually putting it in number format on the screen. Uh, if an accident, peace of mind, you just make a couple of calls and it's taken away, you get a curtsy car in the meantime. You can charge up the car at work if the employer puts on all these things for you. They can provide a charging point at home for you, give you a charge card, and you won't have to bear personally the depreciation of the car. For employees and directors, Electric company cars are fantastic. We've got a client that's got a Porsche Taycan, um, incredible car, and he just can't believe that he's only taxed on 2% of the list price, which for a car like that is an incredible tax-efficient benefit in kind. And I'm a big fan of employers offering salary sacrifice to their um, staff, and the staff take it up, if you provide salary sacrifice in one of six categories here, then it does work and you're taxed on the lower salary and the very small benefit in kind. And one thing that I really noticed over the last two years, a lot of employers now say to employees two things. Do you want to drop your salary and have an electric company car? The tax is incredible. Um, the lack of tax, the tax reduction or completely different. Do you want to drop your salary and the reduction we will pay into an approved pension scheme on your behalf? We could give you more help on that. That is very, very popular when you look at all the figures and the tax savings, but you need to go through that list. But can I point something out? On a pay as you earn audit last year, HMRC said, oh, you've done the salary sacrifice. It does work. I think there's shades of jealousy here. But uh, the inspector said, can I look at the revised employment contract? to see that the employment contract, bottom of page 11, has been revised to take into account um, the salary sacrifice. And we, we, we had done that, so there was no problem with it. But um, so you might want to start that. If you do salary sacrifice, you've got to change the employee's contract of employment. You really want to note that because so many people don't. The revenue catch up with it. And you've got a big problem and they'll say that the salary sacrifice is invalid. So that's so important, um, the comment I just made. Right. I live in a very nice road. I like to think it's a nice road. But the only trouble with my road is there's so many trees and the leaves. It's a constant battle. This isn't fiscal um, or clearing them. But in my road, I have lots of neighbours that um, I know very well. We have a neighbourhood association. It's great. Lots of social dues. I always go there with my card to hand out cards um, to get future clients. But um, being serious, two of the neighbours drive vans. One drives an electric van. And if you look at your notes on page 12, there is no tax at all, no benefit in kind, no tax on the electric van. And he can't believe it. Every time he sees me, he, some, he somehow doubts that this is the case. And I said, relax, you have a beautiful electric van. I see you up and down too much um, on our road, taking your daughter to netball, all sorts of things. There's no taxable benefit for the private use of that van. And the other thing you might want to know, if the van is not electric, obviously there will be a taxable benefit, but you could write in the government's just announced that for next year, 24, 25, 
the benefits are exactly the same as this year. That's good news for the vans. They're not going up. Right, OK, VAT, quick word on VAT. One area that I've specialised in, amongst many others, actually, but I've personally been involved in in the last four years, is helping clients and accountants get their VAT back on cars that are incapable of private use. OK, and middle of page 12. And um, I always ask six questions. The six questions are there. The first one that I ever did, there was a wedding company and they wanted to buy a wedding car just for the weddings that wasn't going to be used for anything else, never taken home. It was a hotel. They got a wedding license. And um, I interviewed them and said, the, the car, the wedding car, is it just going to be used for weddings? And they said, yeah. And they said, the employees have signed a statement and the directors, we cannot ever use it privately. And when there's no weddings, it stays in the hotel car park. We got the VAT back on that. We've been very successful with that. Lots of different companies. We could help you. Our VAT team could help you with that. And you want to go through those six questions in the notes. And um, at a lecture last week, a man said to me, what's your VAT team doing? What's the areas of VAT for businesses that um, you've been successful with. Well, this isn't in the notes, but he mentioned it and I'm mentioning it today. You could jot them down. Three, really. There's loads, but three come to mind. And um, the three are, number one, we've had some clients and um, also some consultancy work where businesses are partially exempt or they're exempt for VAT and they can't recover their VAT and they find lovely business premises, but the landlord has previously opted to tax on those premises. They move in and they have to account for, or they're, sorry, they're charged VAT. And in about four or five cases last year, I said to the tenant, ask the landlord to revoke the option to tax. And they said, oh, we don't know how to do that. Please help us, Tim. So I did it. And I said to him, you made this election years ago, decades ago, because to revoke it, he has to have made it more than 20 years ago. I said, I can't really see anything you're gaining now by keeping this election going. I admit that when you did it 25 years ago, you needed to then, but not now. And I said, can't you just cancel it? And in a couple of cases, they did just revoke it and we helped them revoke it. But one particular landlord um, was negotiating. We had to make a small extra rental payment to him to get him to uh, revoke the option, but it was worth it. So that's something you want to have a look at. If your clients are partially exempt or exempt, they can't recover the VAT and their landlords are charging them VAT because they previously opted to tax more than 20 years ago. You should approach the landlord and ask them to revoke the option. This will then save irrecoverable, potentially 20% VAT. Um, second thing, um, private tuition. If an individual gives sub, uh, tuition in a subject that's ordinarily taught at school or university, then that individual doesn't have to charge VAT, doesn't have to register. That's an area that we really got involved with and we could help you with. Um, HMRC have accepted for us that tennis coaches, tennis is taught at school, they don't have to VAT register. We've even got that for professional golfers in terms of golf tut tutors. Is that the name, golf professional? But we've been successful with it and many others as well. So that's an area that, you know, I see some accountants uh, with their clients still charging VAT for private tuition in circumstances where they shouldn't be. And the other thing, because I specialize in CIS, construction industry tax, the other thing, I think that many builders charge 20% VAT when they should be charging five. Um, when should they charge five? Well, in many cases, but the main case is when they're doing building work that converts a pub, an office, a commercial property, into a residential property. It's 5% VAT. Um, you want to make sure builders charge the correct rate. And um, obviously, but they need to keep documentary proof that what they're doing qualifies for a VAT 5% rate. 
Right, leave you to consider all of that. Now, um, can we move on? Can we go on to page 13? Um, I'm limited in time today, so let's move on a shade. Hospitality. Right. If a company, for example, a business, is putting on a big promotional event, my opinion is if they do it properly, take tax advice, they will get tax relief for the hire of those premises. Um, in your notes on page 13, this was a specific query we had last year. Um, a company was hiring the ballroom at the Europa Hotel in Belfast. This was a specific question we had, a piece of work that was given to us. I lecture at the Europa Hotel in Belfast. I think it's Belfast's premier hotel. I love going there. I love Ireland. I, I love lecturing there. Um, and they have this ballroom and we got the hire of the ballroom allowed but you have to disallow the food and the wine. So you want to split bill um, and the hire of the room will be allowed, hopefully, but not the food and the wine. To, I'll give you a tip to make sure that you get the hire of the uh, room allowed for the promotional event. You want to go to a case called NetLogic Consulting. Or have a look as well at the Red News press release on it and their, um, their manual and their... Uh, statement which I've reproduced on page 13 which confirms really that you should get the hire of the room allowed but not the food and wine but there was a case on this called net logic consulting and the judge in this case said ideally you want to have a um, presentation at the event by senior management and then you have convinced HMRC effectively that this is a business promotional event I always remember many years ago, there was a case where a company um, hired, this, this didn't go to the courts, but I heard about it. Um, they hired the Law Society rooms in Chancery Lane and they just invited their clients and everybody mingled. And HMRC successfully argued that there was no presentations, that you just um, entertain your clients at the Law Society and they refused to give any relief whatsoever for the hire of the Law Society rooms. So really you do want a, um, a presentation and film the presentation and proof um, that you've carried out uh, you know, the presentation and then you'll get the hire, hopefully the hire of the room allowed. You have to be skillful. And if you go to page 15 of your notes, I think there's an art to how you present it, how you advise the client, and we've been pretty successful with this over the years in lots of areas. Boxes um, at the cricket, boxes at a race course, we've got them allowed, but not the food and wine. Can I leave you to read page 15 because I'm running out of time now? Um, but I think there is a skill to it all. And if you present it using the revenues manual, comments there, the comments by the judge in the net logic case, you should be successful. Right, very briefly, page 16, sponsorship. Now, I often get asked by a family company, we have a daughter, for example, who is going to be, who is an incredible tennis player, and we want to sponsor her. Is the sponsorship an allowable trading deduction for the company? Now, I always say two things straight away. I say, well, you should get a contract between your company and your daughter. The engagement's got to be commercial and she's got to justify um, and earn the sponsorship. And I always tell the client to read the case, the Crown and Cushion Hotel versus HMRC, which was exactly that case where very briefly the hotel owner the grandfather had a granddaughter called Alice Powell, who at the time was the top female racing driver, one of them in the UK. And they sponsored her, I think, for £200,000 a year, something like that, I think it was, um, for four years. And HMRC disallowed, disallowed it, said it was duality of purpose, said you only did it because it was your granddaughter. She earned that contract. She had to make personal appearances. Every time she raced, the, this female racing driver, um, the name of the hotel, the, the, their uh, website, it was all over the racing car. 
She had to make public appearances at the hotels. There was a cardboard cutout of her life size in the hotels. She earned that sponsorship. It was fully commercial. They'd sponsored other drivers under the same terms. And when I read it, I thought she was always going to win. And she did. And HMRC never appealed the decision. So if you're sponsoring your children or grandchildren, you have to make it commercial and you have to follow um, that particular case. Right. Have a look at that. Uh, we must move on. Right. Can we go to page 19 now? Part five. PSAs, pay as you earn settlement agreements. Quite simply, I'm going to say. If you can avoid doing them, I would don't do them. Why? Because they are so, so expensive. It's very tempting where you've got a terrific employee and you say, right, we're really pleased with you. And um, what we're going to do, we're going to give you this benefit and we're going to pay your tax on it. We're going to pay your national insurance. If you do that, it costs you a fortune, you being the employer. You have to grow stuff. You have to pay class 1B national insurance. I've given you a calculation on page 20 which you want to work your way through, and you'll see the massive cost of doing a PSA. It's more than 100%. And if there's VAT on the um, uh, benefit, you have to bring the VAT in, even though you can recover it as input tax, and it makes it even more expensive. Follow that calculation through um, after uh, the webinar. I wouldn't do it. Can I give you my advice? I wouldn't do PSAs. I just think they're so expensive. And what I would do instead, I would try and provide very tax efficient benefits in kind rather than give a benefit and then pay the tax on it. On behalf of the employee, you have to gross up. As I say, it costs you class 1B. Why don't you give a company credit card, the use of the company credit card to an employee? And hopefully in that case, they can rack up air miles and there's no tax on the air miles. You want to do planning and we could help you at Gravita with this so that um, you give tax efficient benefits in kind to the employees rather than do PSAs. I always think medical insurance, uh, if you do it correctly, AXA, um, I think that is a terrific benefit you can get for your family. And the actual taxable benefit in kind for what you're getting is negligible. Same with trivial benefits in kind, tax free. If you do your planning, that's what you should be doing. I think PSAs are just too expensive. Right, going to page 21, page 21, um, capital allowances and landscaping. I'm just going to say a brief, quick word on that. HMRC are very aggressive with landscaping, and they say it's capital expenditure, and um, capital allowances are not available on it, can't be claimed on it. I don't agree. In some cases where the landscaping is performing a prominent role, functional, and it's themed landscaping, I think you should claim the capital allowances, and we have done so, and we have been successful. Can I just give you a quick example? A few years ago, uh, we had a company contact us that owned hotels. They got a wedding license for a particular hotel, and they wanted to landscape the gardens. And they said, will we get relief for landscaping the wedding gardens so that we can hold weddings outside in the summer? And they said, this will increase our revenue dramatically. And I worked through it with them. Um, and they did landscape the gardens and it made an incredible difference. One of my relatives actually got married um, at the hotel in the gardens. It was incredible. Um, I'll, I'm going to think back to the ceremony now. And they play the first song. The Carpenters, we've only just begun. If you've never heard that, Google it and it would bring a tear to your eye. But um, my battle was to get the capital allowances. And we argued quite heavily, it took a long time, but HMRC conceded and gave in and we got them because it was theme landscaping, functional, playing a prominent role, massive role um, within the company, the wedding company, hotel company's uh, trade. Have a look at my notes on that and um, we could help you and assist you in that area as well. Right, um, I'm almost out of time now. Um, page 22, the last chapter of this morning, IHT. Can I just say that IHT you need assistance with in specific areas, I think. And Gravita is doing, I understand, 
an IHT webinar in April. If you follow our website, you'll get all the details of that when we put it up. Um, what you might want to do is be disciplined and perhaps once a fortnight, have a look at Gravitas webinar, uh, sorry, website, our website, because we cover so much on that website. We give you our blogs, tax tips, and then you can always see the events that are, are going to come up in due course. So have a fortnightly look at um, Gravitas website and you'll see all the things we're doing and um, the blogs and our tax tips and everything else going on there. And as I say, because I'm almost out of time now, we're going to have the RHT webinar, I believe in April, but you can see the website and you get all the details there. And that will go through it. And you need assistance, particularly on business property relief for RHT. The revenue are very aggressive with it. And um, uh, we could help you in that area. Right, I've come to an end now. So I'm going to just say a few final things. Can I perhaps have a conclusion? Um, there are many business tax areas. We had part one uh, webinar earlier, part two today, um, but I've touched the surface really today. There's so much we can do for you, so much planning that you could do for your clients, and you want to do that planning to stay ahead of the game, be it VAT, cap allowances, whatever. So contact us after the webinar. We, we'd be delighted to help you. Um, if you've got any questions after today, you can email me. I'll put that up again. That's my email address there, tim.palmer at gravita.com. And finally, can I just remind you of the forthcoming webinars that Gravita are putting on? All of the details are on the website. You could log in to that um, and you can join up. But um, these are the forthcoming three. There's more, but these are the next three that we're putting on. Um, and I'm briefly going to say a quick word on each of them. The first one, the R&D webinar. Um, we've got two of our um, people in our, from our R&D team, real experts, and they're going to talk you through what you can and what you cannot get R&D claims on. I would strongly recommend you watch the hour of that webinar. Right, the next one after that, we are going to reflect on the budget. We've decided this year not to have an immediate budget webinar straight after the budget but we're going to reflect and give you the planning and the tax opportunities available so you want to look at on the 13th of march um, on our attend that on our budget um, planning webinar and our team are going to put that on and i'm going to be doing the cap allowances webinar with assistance from um, our gravita team on Thursday, 21st of March. I would strongly recommend that you watch all of those three, but um, that one in particular is gonna be very practical because there's been big changes to cap allowances recently, particularly for companies. Um, and we're gonna go through and tell you areas that you could miss, that you're not claiming cap allowances on when you should be. So that'll be worth watching as well. Right, I'm gonna finish now. Can I thank you very much for watching this morning? Can I thank Hillary behind the scenes, who's excellent and puts all this on and does all the technical stuff for me to stop me from um, going off or whatever. So thank you, Hillary. And can you complete our feedback survey as well? We always like to hear from you and we like to hear your thoughts and comments. So if you could complete the feedback survey as well. Um, and Tom, who introduced you, had to unfortunately dash off because he's his flight was put forward. If you want to contact our tax partner, Tom, Thomas Adcock, he'd be delighted to hear from you as well. Thank you very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.